Welcome to the Ask Me How I Know show. I'm your host, Julie Holly, and I'm so excited you're here. Ask Me How I Know is the only podcast in the multifamily niche replicating what takes place outside the walls of a seminar. Remember when we used to get together like that? This is like the lobby where honest, unscripted conversations take place and transformation happens. We'll talk about practical problem solving in the multifamily niche as well as overcoming mental roadblocks. This episode is brought to you by Three Keys Investments. Three Keys Investments is dedicated to helping people like you, yeah, you, enter the multifamily investment space to build passive income and legacy wealth. If you haven't already subscribed and reviewed Ask Me How I Know, I'd be honored if you did. Thanks so much for joining me today and now for our featured guest. Welcome back to Ask Me How I Know. Today I have my very first outside of multifamily um, operators type person on Ask Me How I Know. I'm so excited to have you on the show, Isaac. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing great. Hopefully the weather holds up and we'll uh, manage this podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, well, hurricanes are brewing and, and... you know, we we're talking that lends itself so well to exactly what you do. So if you don't mind, just bring our audience up to speed on what is it you do, Isaac? Okay, I'm a commercial insurance broker. Uh, the main difference between, I guess, a broker and an agent is that we work with multiple companies throughout the entire nationwide uh, to serve our clients, make sure they're getting competitive prices, comprehensive coverage, and in the event of a, a main storm, like like we're, we're experiencing now or any other, um, you know, events that happen that they're properly covered and either on the liability side, on the property side, that their property, that their property is properly covered and that they're able to continue successfully operating their multifamily or construction, what, you know, whatever it is exactly that they do. Awesome. And so you definitely want to stay tuned, listen all the way to the end of this episode, because you're going to pick up a lot of nuggets on what you need to be looking for in your policies. And some of the, I I think some of the current ways of doing things, everything is always shifting. And I know that in every niche, there are always subtle nuances that can save people a whole lot of money or headaches down the road. So are there some of those little micro changes that have taken place even since COVID? Um, not, I mean, the only, the only thing that really changed since COVID is that everybody's working remotely, which I guess has its ups and downs, but just to, to focus, especially on the multifamily sector in terms of changing that there, with the, I guess, um, explosion of, of, you know, not just big operators, but small, like smaller operators, passive investors, other people um, coming onto the multifamily scene, there's been an expansion of, uh, specific insurance programs tailored for the multifamily industry. Um, just to elaborate on that point a little bit is that you have your regular carrier, you know, the big national carriers that we've all heard, you've seen their commercials on, you know, television, radio, the slides and buses, wherever, wherever it is, you know them. And then there are, um, so they're sort of generalists. They take a look at everything. They'll do a manufacturing plant, you know, in the Midwest, they'll do your multifamily. They're more generalists. And then there's programs that are tailored specifically for multifamily. Um, some of them are region specific. Some of them are nationwide. Some of them are class specific. They'll only look at class A. Some of them will look at lower classes. So there's been a lot of customization, if you will, for the multifamily industry and how that's benefited the operators and you know the, the bottom line of people is that when you have an underwriter who's familiar with this specific class of business, uh, they're the underwriting is more thorough, but then the rates and the and the, the annual premiums can sometimes be a lot more competitive. They can just have a general underwriter who's you know just checking boxes and you know spinning you out, spinning the quote out. They have a better understanding. You're able to negotiate. You're able to explain. Uh, you know, ABC. You know, makes this property different than the next property, and it's somebody who actually understands that. So that's in terms of the change that we've seen in again specifically for multifamily is the specific tailored programs for multifamily. That's really powerful. I mean, the, as you're saying, the more niche that you can go, something, there are a lot of advantages that can come about through that. If I, you know, have a class A property, well, I like, I like C and Bs, um, you know, we all want those value adds. And so when you're looking at those properties, is there a way that 
multifamily investors can get connected with a specific is that something that you do where you will service in a specific niche and you broker it out and you know exactly who to broker it to or is that we find the right person for that so that's one of the things that, that we've uh, that we've at also where you know the, the company that works that we pride ourselves on is the research that we do to uh, service our clients in the best way possible. So a client would come and they would say, oh, I'm purchasing this property, you know, give us some background information. Usually we'd ask for a copy of the current policy just to see where things stand, the value and what sort of coverage so that exists. And then we would go, we have our database and if we don't have, you know, if, if what we have in our database is something that we're not happy with, we would actually go out, do the research and find, you know, specific for that region, who it is that's writing, this specific class, who is the most competitive. So just to answer your question directly is that it would come to a broker and the broker would then do their research, use their knowledge and you know, be able to procure them a policy that best fits their needs. I'll say this is one reason why I prefer working with brokers. You have so many more options available that really you, you were able to tailor and customize them to individuals and their needs. So I think that's phenomenal. Exactly. I really want to touch on, you mentioned, you know, based on geography. And so you are able to offer policies across the nation. How do you, what are some of the nuances in those policies um, from California to the Midwest to Florida to where you're at, you know, and getting pummeled by, you know, hurricanes? Right. So uh, just, just, to, to draw some region specific um, examples. Uh, we're located in, in New York City. Um, hurricanes are not a, an everyday occurrence here. Uh, but uh, for example, uh, we ensure we're the brokers of some very, I guess, trophy buildings in, in New York City, some very large buildings. And those, what, when, you get, um, when you get into New York City, there's always the terrorism factor, which can, with this, uh, there's certain capacities that each carrier has when it comes to terrorism coverage. And even though, so you, even though you might think that, you know, carrier A would be uh, very competitive for whatever building it is, they might not have the terrorism capacity. Um, again, because there's a limit in the different regions, different blocks. You know, for example, Times Square is considered a high terrorist target. So there, there would be, um, Based on the probability, would, an insurance company would be able to insure less buildings there than, say, on, you know, on more of the outer boroughs. Um, that's not something that, you know, when you're looking in the Midwest, in the middle of Nebraska, there's a much less uh, chance of terrorism or anything happening. And therefore, the, uh, the carriers are not hampered by that, what they call terrorism capacity. Um, there is wind risk when you mentioned Florida. Florida is as we all know, is, is battered by hurricanes pretty often. Uh, there, there are some carriers who will not touch water because of the different, um, because of all the hurricanes and the, the, the mass, when, when there's a hurricane, the mass losses that they can incur. There have been unfortunate uh, there were lawsuits against certain programs and carriers who sort of, you know, overextended themselves in terms of coverage when it comes to Florida. So Florida has that aspect of it, that there's the, the there's a lot of, um, again, different carriers are interested in different things, so they have th their own set of carriers. Another interesting thing with Florida is that um, in Hurricane Andrew was in 1993-1994, they changed the, co um, the building code there. So any building that was built prior to that is going to be a lot harder to insure than buildings that were built after 1994 because of the code change. The code was brought up to date to make um, housing and buildings and yeah, multifamily more uh, hurricane friendly, if you will, to be able to withstand, which will, you know, which results in the, um, the carriers paying out less in the event of a loss. So there's every, again, and knowing, and then there's um, other regions which have higher crime rates and that makes um, care also certain carriers hesitant to write there based on the vandalism that they know that occurs there or on the liability side of certain crimes again you know person to interpersonal crimes I guess if you if you will uh, that you know bring a higher liability to our to the operator so every region and then just you mentioned uh, California has earthquakes every region has their own um, unique set of uh, pros and cons if you will and that 
uh, definitely spills over into uh, the insurance uh, insurance world as well. Are there some, um, you know, just general rules where you can kind of say, okay, if I'm looking in, I have, you know, a lot of people are, you know, investing in the Carolinas, for example, you know, are there some just general rules where you say, hey, you know, generally speaking, um, you're going to be looking at rates that are, you know, whatever percentage of your purchase price, or is there something like that, that you would, that you could comfortably say, these are some generalizations that you can apply. So uh, that's a great question, a question that I do that often. And um, I'm sorry to answer with such vagueness, but it, there is and there isn't. Meaning there is, there is certain general um, rates you can expect based on a region, you know, based on property value, but, uh, per unit, the way, just to uh, back up a second, property, the way the, the rates are determined is based on the value and the um, liability portion of it is usually determined, let's say with a multifamily, is usually determined based on the amount of units, the amount of doors that are on the property, and then if there are many, the swimming pool obviously adds extra um, extra liability, certain uh, uh, like a park or monkey bars, those types of things um, definitely increase the you know the exposure of the of liability. Um, but to get, getting back to, to your question, so there are standard rates. However, and this is something I say often to uh, you know to when investors are doing due diligence every property is underwritten individually meaning we'll send we'll prepare the package we'll send it over to the different carriers that we feel or different programs that we that feel would be a fit for this property but if the property next door is a great property and this property unfortunately um, which is something that I have dealt with there was a shooting or some other um, you know disturbance that comes up and then I will we'll see, they'll check the local news, they'll still check if anything happened at that particular property. And even though you have a property that you know two miles away that the rates are ABC, this can be totally different. It can be because of the individual the um, the individual properties or what exactly happened at that location. So the answer is yes and no. You know, you can expect, but what, what's what it, what is a good what always is a good indication is to get a copy of the current policy. The current policy usually uh, usually is a, a good indication of where um, where your range should be. Again, that could change. I don't know if we'll discuss it later on, but in a value add, there are certain um, times where the current policy might not fit for what your the new operator's plans are. But assuming everything stays the same, a copy of the current policy is definitely a good idea. Uh, and the reason why I say a policy, even though a lot of times you see the T12s, you see uh, whatever the offering memorandums where they'll put in a line item for insurance, um, that's not always accurate. We'll leave it at that, you know, leave it at that. Getting a copy of an unredacted copy of a policy is always the best, always the best policy when it comes to underwriting for insurance for a specific multifamily. It does that, uh, generally speaking, is that um, when it's not very accurate, would you say that, you know, we sh that underwriters, you know, as you're underwriting your deal, you should kind of maybe boost it up a little bit? Definitely. And th there, are, there are a number of factors there. Um, number one is if you if you buy if the current owner is, let's say, a national operator or a regional operator, someone who has a large portfolio, um, nine out of ten times, it will be on what's called a master policy, which is a policy that covers several locations. And if you can picture it as um, a Costco or uh, of insurance, that when you economies buy insurance, of scale. I'm sorry. Economies of scale. <laughs> economies of scale, exactly. When you buy insurance in bulk, you get a better price. So even though um, you know operator, regional operator who has ten or twelve large properties in whatever area it is, and they're paying you know, whatever the rate they're paying, that's because it's spread, the insurance company or the insurance carrier is getting a large account, they're spreading their life, they're spreading the, uh, you know, the rate across multiple properties and therefore um, they're getting whatever rate that is. If you're now coming in as an, as, as an individual and you're buying this property alone, right, you can expect, again, a good broker will, you know, do his work and try to get you definitely the most competitive rates, but, Sometimes it's unfair to expect that same rate when you're coming off of a master policy. That's um, that's a. Uh, another difference is is value add. Um, 
oftentimes you have the large, again, you have uh, large operators who just keep things the way it is. There's, there's whatever cash flow exists, they're happy with, or the cash flow doesn't exist, and that's why they try to offload the property. And then you, as a, an investor, you see um, a lot of potential. You can do this, whatever there the, is a large vacancy or this, the apartments haven't been updated in years, and you want to do a value add project. Um, value add, there's, the, there's a broad spectrum of what value add can mean. It can mean a can of paint and a new light fixture, or it can mean some serious work. Um, when you're getting involved in serious work, some policies do have what's called a construction exclusion, which obviously the insurance company understands that regular maintenance is needed at whatever, any um, multifamily property, but anything more that's classified as regular maintenance would be, coverage would be excluded. And obviously, if you're planning to do a value add with major renovations, that would be excluded. You would need a different type of policy and more, with more comprehensive coverage or just one that didn't have that exclusion. And that might change the premium as well. So there's the, the, the underlying theme in insurance is make sure you're comparing apples to apples. And there's a lot of different re reasons why things can be different types of apples or, or apples and oranges, if you will. So it's always important to get the whole picture, always important to tell your broker the whole picture, right? If there's a large, vac if there's a, a very, you know, large vacancy or recent vacant, a lot of recent move outs, it also changes the, uh, changes what will happen. Some carriers are not are uncomfortable with 50% occupant, um, you know, vacancies. Some are okay with it. Some want 60. You know, again, the, the most and more, most comprehensive details you can give to your broker will ensure the best outcome for you when it comes to uh, purchasing new properties. That is so thorough and so helpful, you know, and I, and I'm thinking about those umbrella policies. I, I'm, assuming that's what they're called if you're going to you know be doing some major reno on your property and you know that's excluded from your main coverage so i love that you or riders what are those called um the umbrella policy is something else it's just okay. there, there's property coverage sir it, it really depends on the carrier and on the form um certain and on the level of risk that the carrier is taking on there is a policy for you know major major renovations if you're you know, doing a gut renovation on, on a multifamily, then you, on the property you get what's called a builder's risk policy. But even if, I'm not even talking about, you know, extreme uh, renovations. If you're doing over a kitchen, you know, or it, gutting the whole, not, you know, you're keeping the walls where you're taking everything else out. Um, you don't want to be in a situation where the insurance company will say, oh, well, that's not really routine maintenance. We're not, we're going to deny, you know, we're going to deny this claim. You want to make sure that the, policy that you have covers that. So again, knowing policies and knowing what the appetites of different uh, carriers, what risk they're willing to take on, uh, makes a big difference in this case. And you know, certain certain carriers with multifamily understand. This goes back to what I was saying before. When you have a tailored program for multifamily, they understand that, you know, seven out of 10 times or five out of 10 times when a new purchaser is buying a multifamily, they're going to do some significant value add. And they're being that they know the situation, they're more comfortable with saying you can do more than routine maintenance. The larger carriers, um, they have their, you know, there's everything, their ducks in a row, everything is set, and there's very little room for maneuvering. And they'll just say, you know, you can do routine maintenance. Anything outside of routine maintenance, there is no coverage. And then, again, you can risk it, but then you're risking the whole deal, essentially. If there were to be a, were to be a claim, there's something that's, again, that's a business decision on the, the owner operator side. With, with so many, you know, investors priding themselves on their conservative underwriting to, to not do this component well would completely undermine the, the nature of conservative underwriting. So I really Absolutely. appreciate the nature of this complements and supports that to its fullest. I can't imagine what would happen if you're in there and you decide to do some major reno and something crazy happens and now you're filing a claim and they're like, oh, well, you're not covered. <laughs> you're gutting the unit. <laughs> right, exactly. And, and that's why, I mean, again, you know, the bottom line is, is the bottom line, is, is, every, is everyone's concern. But if you think of the bigger picture in the long run, sometimes if you pay a little more for a little bit robust, more robust coverage, it, you're in a much better position. And when you're doing construction, there is always increased risk of, of things happening, unfortunately. And it just, again, it's a business decision on the side of the owner-operator, but 
as as an insurance professional, I would always suggest getting that you know not being not putting yourself in a situation where you might be stuck. As, as the, uh, um, is there a time that you have witnessed your policies just absolutely act like Captain America's shield to your clients and just really protect them? You know, in a natural disaster or you know, in just some wild situation. Definitely. I'll, I'll start the other. Happen. I'm sorry. Accidents happen. Exactly. Exactly. Accidents definitely happen. Um, I'll start the other way with some horror stories of, okay. yes. of you know, of, of clients that, that, that we took on, you know, but prior to us didn't have proper coverage. Um, just one that comes to mind um, is, okay, this is more of a, more of an operational side, but um, for, on the uh, on the operator, but there was a multifamily property that there was a, a dog attack. The, whatever there was, the one of the tenants had a dog. Somebody came to a neighbor, and the dog was I believe it was a pit bull attacked the dog and bit them. And they obviously filed suit. Um, so the the first thing that I would tell all multifamily operators is make sure that your tenants have renters insurance that includes liability coverage. It's extremely extreme. It's inexpensive. It's to be $150. It can be really, really, uh, really cheap. And what that does is ask that acts as a buffer between your liability policy and whatever occurrence would happen. So in this case, the dog uh, bit someone, unfortunately, the operator, uh, did not make sure that the tenant had coverage. So, so even though the tenant was sued, the operator was sued also, was sued in addition, and there was no coverage from the tenant, and it went on to the, uh, oh, wow. you know, the onto their onto their policy. Now, what that does is besides for obviously have you know making your rates increase and making a, a pain in the neck for the operator, it also when it comes to renewal and when it comes to trying to remarket this policy when there's a loss, especially something like that, which shows a little bit of um, I'm trying to think of the, the, the nicest way to say it, but a little bit of incompetency on the side of the operator, it makes other carriers much more hesitant to take on someone like that. So it's it's always best, and I t try to tell this to, you know, to anyone who listen, is make sure that your your tenants have um, have that coverage. And if you know there's software or you can you know set up an Excel, Excel spreadsheet to see when, you know, to be on top of them to renew it and get a certificate, some sort of proof of active coverage. But it's that's number one to make sure. Um, that being said, certain policies do have what's called an uh, either a vicious animal exclusion or a complete animal exclusion, which again would put an operator in a bad position to say, in this case, thankfully, uh, you know, that policy did not have it. But if the and vicious animal is one of those vague terms, some policies define what it is. Some say vicious breed of dog, and then, you know, it's up to you to figure it out. Obviously, you know, a chihuahua wouldn't fall into that uh, uh, description, but it, it's when Having vague terms on a policy is never a good thing. So it's something to look out for when you, um, on a policy if you have an animal exclusion or a vicious dog exclusion, something to consider to look out for and try to get it removed. Um, another example of somebody, unfortunately, not having the proper coverage, this is, that, that was on the liability side, this is more on the property side, is I was dealing with a client who was purchasing a, a large multifamily um, complex, if you will, and Prior, during, I think it was during contract or maybe right before contract, one of the buildings, it was, I think it was 42 buildings. Um, one of the buildings, where there was a fire and it was complete, was a total loss, completely burned down to the ground. It actually affected the building next door a little bit also. Um, what happened was, is that the building was insured for whatever the amount was, but that was not the true replacement cost of the building, which means to replace the, let's say the building was insured for 600,000, um, you know, and really to, re to rebuild the building would cost a million dollars. Uh, there's that four hundred dollar, four hundred thousand yeah. dollars uh, discrepancy that exists, which made the sale much more complicated because the the original sale was for forty two buildings, not forty one buildings, and the owner was trying was haggling back and forth with their insurance company, trying to get you know the maximum amount that they would get, but if it wouldn't cover the amount to rebuild the building. It, it jeopardizes again your value and jeopardizes the deal. Thankfully, the deal went through, but I, I'm pretty sure the seller took a little bit of a loss on the deal. So, 
it's important to make sure that when you have your property coverage that your building value is accurate. And the reason why I would stress that also is because sometimes the bank, the, usually the, the lender or the bank will determine what value they want to take. Sometimes they're negotiable a little bit, sometimes they're not. But oftentimes what I've seen, I've seen this more, I call out of state because we're, I'm from New York, but outside, you know, outside of New York, I've seen the values that the bank require are not that high. And if you were to talk to a builder or developer or somebody in that region, they would tell you $65 a square foot, for example, to rebuild a building is, is just, it's, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't exist. So if you're insuring your building at $65, $65 a square foot and the building burns down, you're in, a, you're in, a, you know, in, in hot water when it comes to rebuilding. And especially if you're a syndicator like yourself, you have investors to answer to, it's not a position you want to be in, so it's definitely worth doing your own research. Uh, it doesn't take much, uh, but to make sure that the replacement cost that we're, that's being insured is somewhat accurate, you know, is accurate to, to some, you know, not, not just the number pulled out of the hat, essentially. Right, definitely. Well, and as we see building costs rise, it's really important to have, like you're saying, apples and apples. You know, make sure that your policy is is mirroring that. Wow. Right, right. And just to make one more note, once I'm, I'm saying that is, which is going back to what we said before, is that when you're comparing, um, the, let's say, the old policy or the current owner to your policy, um, oftentimes either they have a different bank than you with, or they're using an older valuation, meaning if they own a property for 10 years and the bank 10 years ago valued the property at, you know, whatever it was, XYZ value, um, building costs that you said have gone up over the past years and your lender might require a higher number. And that you know they're there's more, they're offering more coverage, which is going to increase the premium. So again, that makes them not apples to apples. You can't you know it has happened though that someone will say, oh, but they're paying you know much less. They're paying much less. They're insuring much less. And your lender, which you know smartfully so or rightfully so, is um, requiring a, a little bit of a higher value to make sure that in the event that there's a total loss, that you're able to rebuild. That is absolutely powerful powerful things um i know somebody who they had a tornado go through their complex that they owned in ohio and just obliterated it but they came out on the on on a significant upside because of their policies that were in place and i think you have maybe some examples of that as well and definitely, we have, uh, like I mentioned before, there's a we insure several um, trophy buildings in in New York City. One of them had, without giving too many details, um, one of them had some significant damage done, and we thankfully the you know the, it's a condo building. The policy that we have in place was uh, a good one with a top rated carrier, and they paid out significantly. I mean, it's a luxury condo building. You can imagine um, there was some water damage or significant water damage. And you can imagine um, when you're dealing with things on that scale, the amount of that, the dollar value of the damage and having a good broker. Another thing that makes a big difference when it comes to claims, and this is something that is out of my um, realm, is having a good public adjuster um, locally to, again, something to worth it to do research about that. It, the insurance company is going to come in, they're going to send their adjuster, they're, they're always going to lowball because you know, they'd rather pay out as, as little as possible. If you've got a good public adjuster who A, um, has experience with these types of claims, and B, understands policies. Um, I've seen both. I've seen public adjusters who are a lot of bluffs there, and they try to bully the insurance company, but the bottom line is, is the policy is the contract between you and the insurance company, and if something is clearly excluded, no matter how much um, bullying, you know, someone could do. This, they're not going. You're not going to get by. So you really need an adjuster who understands policies, understands coverages, understands nuances, understands where you know some of the gray areas where they're able to uh, push through. I had a client about a year and a half ago who had. They were actually they were uh, renting at a location, and they there was a fire at the location. There were several violations. It took them forever to get back up and running for the landlord to make the place usable again. Which, and they had a large, large business interruption claim. Uh, they weren't able to do business, and they were losing business um, you know, day, day to day. So myself, together with the public adjuster, we put a lot of pressure on the insurance company, and they got paid out 
very, very, I mean, obviously within reason, but very, very nice. Thing. Yeah, I think. Thank you. They're, they're a client for life. That's all. Uh, this is what I'll say now. They, they, really, they really appreciate my efforts and the adjuster. It's, it's, it's a, a concerted effort for, you know, there's things that the adjuster knows and does that is beyond what, you know, what a, what a broker can do, but the broker definitely should pull the strings and, again, should understand the policy, should point things out. Uh, there are policy extensions. There are all the different um, nuances within a policy that between a good broker and a good public adjuster should, you know, help the, uh, the client come out in, in a good situation where they can rebuild and be able to move on or, may, or somehow make them both from the loss that they, uh, that they uh, experienced. You touched on something else that Isaac is so important, and that is your willingness to get your hands messy and to make sure things are going properly in, you know, when something goes sideways. Uh, you know, having somebody that has strong communication and somebody that knows a policy and that is proactive and actively involved is significant because sometimes you, you might partner up with some broker and Something happens. They're like, "Well, I just wrote the policy." See, so, you know what I mean? Absolutely, absolutely. There are cut and, there are cut and run people. Um, again, there's without you know, I, I don't like putting down competition, but they, there's different ways of doing business. And just to go yeah. back to that claim with the business interruption claim, I was heavily involved. There's a lot of forensic accounting. There's a lot of things that that needed to be done. Which again, I'm not an accountant, definitely not a forensic accountant, but um, using my relationship with the underwriters, with the, in that place is, is actually a program, so I have a relationship with the underwriting manager. Um, I, we were able to push things along, you know, emails, calls, why it's taking so long, what's going on, and it definitely does make a difference. There, there's always, sometimes it's, I mean, with the, with the larger companies, the issue is that the claims department is a completely different department than the underwriting department. So the, uh, so the broker who might have great relationships with the underwriter is a little bit tied when it comes to claims, um, but that shouldn't stop them. You should definitely try to push. And like you said, yeah, that getting down in the mud, you know, as much as, much as you can is, is definitely uh, separates the, men's from, the men from the boys when it comes to uh, insurance broker. And that goes just to back up. That also goes for um, getting the policy. You know, some, like, like I mentioned earlier on, there's, when, especially when it comes to multifamily, especially when it comes to different regions, there's, there's a significant amount of research that should be done prior to providing quotes. Uh, again, you know, without rehashing everything we said before, different, um, different areas have different concerns, have different programs, different carriers that are willing to write, and it's always worth it uh, before presenting the quote to do, you know, so you use obviously information that you know you have, but do a little more digging, a little more research. I like to combine um, using some lo local knowledge with some national knowledge, meaning there's um, local underwriters from whatever particular region who know might know some things a little, little better. And then there are uh, sometimes national underwriters who will have more of a bird's eye view of the country. They look at things differently, yeah, depending on uh, the depending on the um, the location and depending on the results, you know, if they, whoever whoever who offers you the best quote for the best, you know, the most comprehensive coverage is definitely the way to go. Yeah, so it's really it, it's not necessarily go with the local guy. Def, definitely, I, I've seen. I, I can tell you firsthand that I'm not local, and I've we've been we provided more competitive quotes. In one situation, it was actually very weird. The deal actually, unfortunately, didn't go through. But we were able to provide a quote. Uh, they were in contract, and I don't know what they, they fell out of contract for whatever what had happened. But we were able to provide a quote with the same carrier that insured that was on the building on the location now at a bit more competitive price than they had than, than the current owner had. So it was surprising again it's for for more value, meaning it was. They were covering, like I mentioned before, their bank had a little bit higher standard of the replacement cost. So it was higher replacement cost, same carrier, lower premium. Not like, you know, a huge discrepancy, but enough that it you know, made us look good, that's for sure. <laughs> right, right. No doubt at all. Um, are there any, any ways that as, um, you know, we're underwriting our deals that we can, and we're talking with, you know, insurance agents and brokers, and I know I tend to go for brokers versus agents, but you know, I'm speaking for everybody, right? All investors. So as you're having those conversations and you're comparing, um, are there any telltale signs that you would say, these are the red flags that you can 
perhaps look to to see it and say, double check the facts on this one. I'm going to try to be as gracious. You are so gracious. So I'm going to try to be as gracious. So, uh, you know, instead of saying, uh, you might be getting taken advantage of, you know, how can people read between those lines? Um, the first, always ask to see the complete quote and the form, well, the, the forms, what we refer to in, in insurance jargon, is basically a list of the coverages provided. Usually on the full policy is about 127, 135 pages, uh, which, which will explain those forms. But a good broker will be able to see from the actual list, you can see uh, certain exclusions, like I mentioned before. This, and just to add a few that I wrote down before, when it comes to multifamily, there is uh, assault and, an assault and battery exclusion on the general liability side, which would, um, which you know, in the event that someone was assaulted on your property and the and ownership was sued, it would be that would be excluded. Abuse and molestation, similar things. There are student exclusions in higher crime areas. There are often firearm exclusions, which is again something that can be scary. For an owner, if they're brought into a, work, a, a lawsuit because of some sort of, um, you know, crime committed with a firearm, and there's a firearm um, exclusion, is something also to to keep in mind. We mentioned the uh, the animal exclusion, the construction exclusion. So again, something that you really have to look get as much information. What I would say is get as much information as possible from the person presenting the quote. You know, just an email saying, oh, I got you a great quote with a great carrier. This is the premium. It's usually, I don't want to say it's a red flag, but always request more information. The other thing that I would say also that there are, um, again, keeping this as vague as possible, there are carriers who are notorious for either dragging on claim, dragging out claims, meaning investigations and litigation, whatever it is, or completely denying claims, meaning they have a reputation of having you know, very, very good um, in-house counsel or if they, you know, outsource it, but they, they'll find the, the smallest um, nuance in a contract or in something and, if, and then say, you know, I'm not paying. And there are other carriers who will say they won't go to that um, level or stoop to that level, if you will. And they will, you know, they'll, they're more gracious about paying out. They're more, they're more gracious about the amount they'll pay out. So there's, there is, again, getting the most information. Um, just, again, I have a quote from a great carrier is usually um, not enough information for you as the owner operator to make an educated decision. You wanna know the name of the carrier, the coverages, um, are there any harmful exclusions? Um, does this work with my bank? You know, when, if you're, I don't know if you're syndicating, if you're uh, completely self-funding the deal or you're bringing on a lender, but a lot of these lenders, they have their own set of requirements that they want that you mentioned before, use the word umbrella policy, an umbrella policy is just to put it out there because it's often confused. An umbrella policy is a policy that sits, is a liability policy that's on top of a general liability policy. So just to, the, the quick, uh, the, the quick course, a liability policy usually covers, when it comes to, um, when it comes to real estate, usually covers a million dollars per occurrence, which means, let's say, you know, the most typical is, let's say, slip and fall. Somebody slips and falls on your property, they get severely injured, they'll sue for, million dollars. They'll sue for $10 million or $5 million. So your general liability policy maxes out at a million. Um, anything above that, um, now you're, you as the owner operator or the owner, the owner operator entity is now responsible. Um, when there's a lender involved, they realize that that now becomes a lien against the property and that jeopardizes their position um, when it comes to using the property as collateral. So what they're going to do, what most lenders will do will require what's called either excess liability or umbrella liability. Just two terms, basically the same thing, which is another um, level of coverage on top. So either they want another 2 million, another 4 million, another 10 million, depending on the value of the property or depend, most the value of the property, the, the size of the loan. I've seen some banks um, require it for um, how tall, how many stories the buildings are, up to two stories, they require X, uh, two to four Y, and above that, they require a higher amount. But they're going to require another layer, layer of coverage, which to go back to our slip and fall case, um, if somebody's sued for five million, now you have this extra layer of protection, another insurance, usually another insurance company coming in and it's going to say that we'll pay for um, X, Y, Z. Uh, you know, the, 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 the difference above the million. And one thing to, to be careful with those policies to make sure that your excess policy is what's called follow form, which means that they'll essentially cover anything that the 
the general liability was what, what we refer to as the underlying policy will cover, they will cover as well. There are certain ones that, that don't follow form and they have their own set of restrictions, which is again, something to look at. And again, requesting more information is, even though it might seem overwhelming, is always a, a, a good idea. Or having, or asking your broker to walk you through, you know, asking, you no, know, being educated, um, all the, the education that the owner operator needs is to ask the right questions, but the broker should be able to answer and really offer up without even asking, you know, being asked all the, the details about the policy um, as we discussed. You have, you're proving left and right why you are the master at this. <laughs> you know, everybody, if people play to their strengths and stay in their lanes, then, you know, just magical things happen and you are, I mean, like I said earlier, I'm like, umbrella policy, rider, what? I'm like, no, I understand those are, real, you know, those are simple concepts, but just the ease, like you can tell just the depth of your experience and professionalism. And I greatly appreciate that. I appreciate that. I appreciate the compliment. I have, I have a question that I don't know if you can answer this. It's, I always get into these, I wonders on my rabbit holes and going back to you know, renters, renters insurance. I don't think that, that that is something that, I don't know if that's something that can be required. Um, I'm a big fan of renters insurance myself, but is there an easy way where uh, operators could have agreements or property managers could have an agreement with, you know, someone like you as a broker, where that policy of renters policy, when they're signing their lease agreement, is just sign, sign, sign and can that be part of their um, of their rent each month? Or I'm just wondering if there's a way to incorporate that in to have everybody covered. A lot of time renters will be like, I don't want to pay the extra for renter's insurance. So you can't, I mean, you, uh, I'm trying to think. You can, I mean, you can require that you could put it in the lease. I've seen many leases that, that do say, especially on, um, on the commercial side. There is no commercial tenant who will, will allow anyone to operate, whether it's a, a business, an office, or, or retail location, or whatever it is. There is no no commercial uh, landlord who will allow a commercial tenant to operate without insurance. It's standard, and that you know I have seen leases on the um, on the residential side like that as well. In terms of actually incorporating it into rent, it would be difficult because. Let's take the uh, the case that we discussed before about the dog. The liability it, it's it's a personal liability, meaning the you you each individual um, renter or unit owner needs to be covered personally for anything that they're liable to. So having what you can do is require it. I've seen um, larger companies. I'm pretty sure Liberty Mutual or other companies will. Um, you know, take us out of the picture and partner up with a, with a homeowner association or with the, an owner operator and actually give them back one or two percent um, if they're able to sign up whatever X Y Z you know amount of, of people in their program. They do offer it as a program basis, but to have it, it does need to be um, individualized for each owner uh, to do that. And that, yeah, otherwise, if you get into complicated issues of adding that having a master policy and adding everybody on and making sure that you know, making sure every person is added on the right way. It's, it, it's best to have everyone have their own individual policies. And like you said, I, mean, I know people push back because you know, nobody, um, nobody wants to pay for something that they don't feel is necessary. And my boss always says, um, you know, people don't want insurance, don't want to pay for insurance until they need it and it's too late. So, but it's definitely something that I think you can explain to most people and it's not a huge expense. I mean, I've seen policies literally under hundred dollars, you know, for, for a smaller apartment with, with lim you know, limited amount of, of coverage. And what you as the operator really want is that you, what you want them to have is a liability coverage. So if they're say they're giving you a hard time, tell them, okay, cover $10,000 or whatever the minimum that the policy will accept for personal property. Um, bring that down, you know, to the minimum and that will cut expenses. Cut as, uh, gut as much out on the property side. Um, as you can, but on the liability side, I want either whatever, you know, whatever, either whatever the, the limit that you want, either 300,000, 500,000, a million, whatever, whatever you, um, you know, the owner operator sees reasonable. But there is way, there are ways to work around, and they're definitely um, having a relationship with the broker. We focus more on commercial than actual renters' policies and, and uh, the individual policies, but 
you know, a case that you brought up. If it's me servicing our client and helping the commercial client on personal policies, it's something definitely that we, we do as well. Or we would steer in the right direction. Um, there are some times where it's worth it. And for the sake of full, full transparency, and I'll tell somebody um, it's worth it to go online and go to one of either one of the comparison websites or try your luck with like Allstate or Nationwide, you know, one of them, and just do it directly online. And sometimes you get better pricing than we than we can offer. Yes, um, that is just I feel so grateful every time I this. I love podcasting and just I mean being able to share space with you and learn so much it's just this power-packed session with so many important things for everyone to, to really understand and it's a series of these little uh, nuances you know i mean we have all these different components as we're you know underwriting our deals and preparing to syndicate or jv whatever it is and to be able to take just this insurance layer and dissect that is powerful. Yes, it's, it's definitely an integral part. And um, having a good broker, I, I know I offer this to my clients or potential clients, is that sometimes it's difficult for you know an owner operator to do the proper underwriting, no matter how many tips you know we can give out. But to, they're not you know boots on the ground insurance brokers. They don't know all the nuances. Um, reach out to your insurance broker when you're doing on when you're doing on the writing and ask them for to help you you know if they can get specific help and you know and make a couple of phone calls and find out like you said what are the rates and look into the crime statistics look into what's going on or at least when it comes to forms there there's so much that you know it brings to mind i've read a couple of times that people underutilize the knowledge a pharmacist has you know they're you can ask them tons of questions they know what you know what, what what most people just do is they go there they pick up their medicine and they leave insurance brokers like that also there's so much information that they can give you to help you with your underwriting process um, again the best would be for location specific information and, you know, that, but even just general knowledge is so much that they can that can be offered um, and it's worth it just to have a call or an email to figure things out that's right. So attorneys like us to call them, you know, before we even submit an LOI on a property because they want that conversation far in advance. Is there, you know, is when's the best time to reach out to you? Is it I'm looking at this property or I'm going to submit an LOI or what would you say? So I would say it's a process. Um, there's definitely the underwriting process, which is prior to the LOI, prior to any, you know, showing serious interest, definitely reach out then for, like I said, the basic information and a knowledgeable broker or someone willing to, you know, to go the extra mile will definitely do a little bit of research and try to get you some a range of the pricing or, like I said, get a copy of the policy and they'll be able to tell you, oh, they're paying X, Y, Z, but they have this policy which really offers no coverage. Or I see the bank requirements or I know the bank, you know, the standard bank requirements, basically, and I know that this, you know, won't, this won't, won't be good. Um, it's going to be a lot more or it's going to be a lot less or they're, for whatever reason, is grossly overpaying, we can do better. Definitely reach out before. Um, once you do sign the LOI, then definitely reach out to the broker and then they can really start the quoting process, which is they collect all the information or they, help, they might have all the information you already gave them, but they'll submit a package and then send it out to the carriers and begin working with the carriers during, it's during that time where you're, I guess, do, doing a little bit more due diligence and give you a much more accurate idea of what the insurance costs will be uh, for the specific property. That is fantastic. I said, or you could be like some people and call the day before you close and say, oh, I don't have insurance. <laughs> people do that. I know they, they do it in everything with their cars, with their personal residences. It's wild. <laughs> if people want to reach out to you and, and they are just grateful for this information and can tell that you know your, your um, business quite well, um, how, are they, how would you like them to reach out to you? Best way to be on my email address, it's ischwadel at eolshore.com. I'll say it out. It's the letter I, then S as in Sam, C-H-W-A-D as in David, E-L at um, eolshore is the letter E-A-L-L-S-U-R-E dot com. 
Excellent. Is there you anything can tell else? I'm in sales. I've said that, I've said that more, <laughs> once or twice in my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got to do it, right? Yes. Is there any um, any other gems that you would like to leave the listeners with today? Any other gems? Let me, let me just look over my notes. Um, one thing when it comes to um, New, York, New York or New York City specifically is something that's referred to as action over coverage or contractual liability coverage, which um, New York is different than in so many ways, but in this specific way is different than every other uh, um, state in the country that the, the labor laws in New York put a lot more responsibility on the owner um, in the event that a, a worker, meaning we, we, we've had a client who came over to us after this happened, but um, they hired a roofer uh, to, to repair the roof. Unfortunately, the fellow fell off the roof and, um, and actually passed away. Um, and in most states, that would be either worker's comp claim or if, I, I should walk that back. I don't, I don't know if he passed away. I think he got hurt. Um, most case, in most states, that would be a worker that would end that worker's, a, a worker's compensation claim, which would mean he would go to his employer, file a claim, and then get paid with the um, under his workers' compensation policy in New York State, it gives the right to the employee to not sue his direct employer, but to sue everybody above his direct employer. So in that case, it would be the the owner operator of that particular property was sued, and unfortunately, they didn't have this exclusion or did not have this coverage, uh, and oh, wow. it was a serious issue for them. So that's something to keep in mind. And again, that's specifically for New York. Um, and then again, just the, well, what I said before. You, it does, never hurts to reach out to your broker to have them to review your policy, even if you think. And the other thing is also, if you're comfortable with your broker, I value relationships you know that people have with um, their current brokers. But ask questions. Don't don't feel like even though they definitely you know not most insurance nine out of ten or ninety nine percent of insurance brokers are great and have their clients best uh, best interests in mind. But things change over time, and it's always good to ask. You know. You don't have to be combative. You don't have to say, oh, this is way too high of a price. But is there something better? Is there other programs that the insurance industry does evolve on a regular basis? And it's worth it to ask the questions and make sure that you're getting, you know, the best, the best that there is to offer. Fantastic. Isaac, I am grateful for your time. I'm thankful for your expertise that you have honed and refined very clear. It's so obvious and it's such a gift to us. So we wish you the best in this hurricane over in <laughs> New York and that you don't have to have any, any insurance claims of any kind. Okay. I'm hoping we keep, I'm, act, I'm actually in, in our New Jersey office today, uh, but we're getting battered uh, just the same in New York, New Jersey. We're, we're pretty close. Um, actually, the building was actually like, I felt the wind before uh, over here, but uh, thankfully it's, it sounds like they calmed down. I, I don't hear any more, uh, oh, any more rain outside. I'll check. There's no windows in this room. Wow. Well, I wish you the best and I wish you a wonderful rest of your day. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate the time, taking the time to uh, ask the great questions and I hope they were helpful. And you know, I gave the, my email address if anyone has any or if you yourself want to reach out, have any more specific questions, feel free and I will do my best to, uh, to help or guide you in, the, um, in whatever, whatever it is you need. Thanks so much for joining me for another episode of Ask Me How I Know. This episode was brought to you by Three Keys Investments. They are dedicated to helping people like you. Yeah, you, my awesome listeners, develop passive income and legacy wealth through multifamily investing. Feel free to check out their website, threekeysinvestments.com, to see if there is an offering that will help your portfolio grow and meet all of your needs. If you haven't already rated, reviewed, subscribed, liked all of those bells and whistles, I would be absolutely honored if you would do that for Ask Me How I Know. Thanks again and go make it a great day.